that's what I would suggest to anybody running for mayor, whether it's a, a smaller city or a larger one, is to be prepared to work day and night on creating positive working relationships because uh, you're going to need them as you try to move your community along. Welcome to another episode of the GovGab Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Andreco. Thanks for being along on this episode and excited to introduce our guest for today, the mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana, Tom Henry. Mayor Henry is serving his third term as the mayor of Fort Wayne. And prior to that, he actually held a seat on the uh, city council for 20 years uh, from 1983 to 2003. So he's got a tremendous amount of experience and insight that he shares throughout this episode in a very thorough manner. I really appreciate a lot of his answers and, and how he talked through not only the you know, past and, and present, but also the future and some of the challenges that they expect in the city and how they're kind of trying to overcome them or at least be thoughtful about them uh, going forward. So we really have a great um, dialogue throughout. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, Mayor Henry being on the episode and excited for him um, to share his story with everyone. So without further ado, let's jump in my chat today with Mayor Tom Henry. Mayor Henry, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining this morning. My pleasure. Thank you. So excited to uh, to chat with you. You know, I've, I've talked with a lot of folks uh, in this state and, you know, and, and around different initiatives and stuff. So I was really excited to get a chance to speak with you. Obviously, one of the largest cities in the state. Um, and figure out what you guys are doing there. And more importantly, I, I'm always curious of how you got involved in in the local government <laughs> and those type of things. So maybe that's a good place for us to start. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to, if you could take us back um, sure. more, because I know you're on the council for a little while and we'll get into that Correct. before you became mayor. What was the first initial thing? And maybe it was back when you were really young. Why did you want to get involved in the community? Um, what was <laughs> what was inside you? What kind of made you, you know, spark that, I guess? We'll start there. Well, when I was younger, my father was a precinct committeeman. He was a ward chairman. So I was exposed a little bit to the political arena as he worked for a number of different candidates uh, through the years. And sometimes he would have me go out and walk with him and hang door hangers and that type of thing. So I had a little bit of an introduction to the to the whole political campaign uh atmosphere as I was as I was growing up. Uh, but I really uh, got serious when uh, back in 1982, we had a pretty severe flood in Fort Wayne. We happened to have three rivers that converge uh, downtown, and all three of them went over their banks during a very heavy rain event. And I was a uh, I was a Red Cross volunteer as a uh, as kind of a uh, a mission of mine to try to help out the community in various ways. And again, one of them was to be a Red Cross volunteer. And I got activated to go to a certain part of town to help evacuate people and put them into shelters and the like. Uh, and during that several day period, uh, I. Uh, became aware that uh, I <laughs> that I did not think that uh, the the section of town that I was representing was getting its fair share of help from the city. Now, unbeknownst to me at that time, our whole city was underwater. But I was uh, I was more concerned about my little sector, and I wanted more more help for the uh, the constituents in that area, if you will, as far as uh, additional food and and, uh, and uh, first aid supplies and so on. So I went down to City Hall, tried to uh, get them to give us more. And of course, the explanation that I that I received from them was they were doing all of their all that they could. Uh, and I again, I did not think it was sufficient. So I decided to take on the city councilman in that area to be put in a position where by gosh, in the future, that part of town would get its fair share. And again, realizing now 
that uh, uh, the mayor and his administration had their hands full in the, you know, throughout the entire city. Uh, but again, at that time, I wanted my my little part of our city taken care of. So I I ran for city council in, in 1983, and I and I won. And that's that was the beginning. And I served on city council 20 years. Can you talk about some of those experiences on city council then kind of what obviously because because I'll be curious, obviously, as a, as a mayor, all the things you've been involved with. But as a council, maybe sometimes they don't get the, the love as much sometimes from folks or at least the, the <laughs> citizens. So tell me a little about that experience. Obviously, 20 years on that. I, I'm assuming you had to get reelected several times. Um, Correct. Five times. Right. Years. Yeah, uh, we served four year terms. And uh, what uh, I think what appeal to me most about the city council position once I got in. And again, when I won, I had no idea really what, what I was getting into. I ran because I was upset uh, with the city as far as uh, uh, my interpretation of what the, uh, what the city was doing as far as sharing resources uh, throughout the entire community. And I just wanted our fair share for my section of town. Uh, but once I got into city council, I realized, or on city council, I realized that really a, a city councilman's job was kind of threefold, if you will. Uh, one uh, was to be a citizen's advocate. I had at that time about 20 neighborhoods in the district, and my job was to meet with neighborhood association presidents and the other officers was to go to as many neighborhood association meetings as my schedule would allow uh, to actually pull a lot of those association presidents together and, and form kind of a, uh, a, um, a partnership, if you will, between all of them, because sometimes needs would overlap into adjoining neighborhoods. But the whole job was to, for my job, uh, was to try to make sure that the needs and, and, and the wants and the desires of the neighborhoods were met. And most of the time that dealt with infrastructure needs, uh, whether it was streets and, and roads and curbs and sidewalks, or in some cases, uh, city utility needs, you know, water and sewer and the like, and traffic control and that type of thing. But that was one part of my my job I, uh, that I identified. The second part was legislative, to make sure that the uh, city statutes continue to be appropriate for our city? Did, did they need, in some cases, to be eliminated? Did they need to be tweaked? Or did we need to add new ones? So I made it a point of studying our, our code of, of statutes in the city and, and working with other city council members to determine whether we should uh, change um, you know, certain city statutes and the like. And then the third one was budgetary. Uh, we had a city budget at that time, uh, probably in the in the vicinity of a hundred million or so, and uh, you know the the mayor would prepare a budget, send it down to us, and then we had roughly two months to go over the budget and determine whether or not uh, it was appropriate. We we're not allowed by state statute to increase uh, the budget, but we certainly were allowed to decrease it, and in several instances we did. Uh, but those were the those were the three areas of responsibility that I identified, and uh, I I thought I worked very hard at, at trying to um, make sure that those areas were were being addressed, and it was an extremely enjoyable um, uh, time of my life. Uh, there's no question that public service um, is something that, quite frankly, uh, can be addictive. Uh, the more I was able to do for uh, my neighbors and for those uh, in my district, the more I wanted to do. So it's it's no wonder that a lot of people who get involved in politics want to stay. So the transition from council member to mayor, talk about that transition because <laughs> you, you could have stopped. But why did you decide well, to run for mayor ultimately? Well, actually, I was running for a sixth term on city council because again, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Well, I got beat. Um, we had gone through some massive annexation uh, in our city uh, under a Republican mayor. Now I happen to be a Democrat. 
but uh, we had a, a Republican mayor in whose uh, legacy he wanted uh, his one he wanted his legacy to be that he uh, enlarged our city both in land mass and in population, and that's exactly what he did. He had a supportive city council, and he did uh, significant annexation. Well, at the same time, the the year 2000 uh, had passed, and uh, under dictate, we had to uh, take a look at redistricting in order to appropriately uh, represent the, the various districts of the city as far as population. Well, the Republicans controlled council, and um, right or wrong, they <laughs> they brought in a number of new neighborhoods that were predominantly Republican and moved a lot of my uh, heavily Democratic uh, neighborhoods into other districts. And I ended up losing uh, my district by about 100 votes. Um, so I, I lost, and uh, but that was okay. I, uh, obviously, I was somewhat depressed because I had worked very hard. But uh, in the political arena, when you do redistricting, and in some cases, uh, that could be interpreted as gerrymandering, but it is what it is. Uh, they they moved the districts around, and I ended up getting beat. But uh, uh, so I accepted that uh, begrudgingly, <laughs> uh, but I accepted it. Uh, and then for four years, I, I was fine. I had a business, and uh, I, I went back into the, the private sector, uh, but. Uh, what happened the following uh, municipal election period, though, was the mayor at that time, uh, who was a two-term Democratic mayor, opted not to run for a third term. And he uh, appeared to have waited to kind of the 11th hour, so the Democrats had an extremely difficult time trying to recruit somebody to be their candidate for mayor. And they asked me on a couple of different occasions, and I declined because I was uh, used to the legislative branch and really didn't have any desire to move to the executive branch. But they uh, they stayed on me. They even recruited my wife to support their plea, uh, which obviously made a, a significant difference in my thinking pattern. Um, but uh, and others as well. Uh, finally, I took a look at who was going to be their the Republican candidate and felt that I could do as good a job, if not better, than him. So uh, I ended up uh, running, and uh, um, uh, in, in November of that year, I, I won. Was there one thing? No, you were... my third term. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's and that's a that's a good run with it. Uh, when you started out, was there? I don't know, one thing that you're kind of nervous about kind of running for the office that maybe has been confirmed um, or maybe has been debunked that you shouldn't have even worried about it in the first place. Anything you could share um, kind of in that time to, to transition and running for mayor? I, I think probably the, the biggest concern of mine was that I didn't know anybody outside at the local level. I knew the city council members and I knew some of the businessmen and women but I realized very quickly that a municipality, especially the size of Fort Wayne, had to communicate constantly with legislators at the state level, uh, the governor's office, a lot of the state departments, in some cases, the federal legislators and departments in Washington. And I had absolutely no experience uh, in that, nor did I know anybody. Uh, and that was that was uh, that put me in a rather um, stressful situation uh, because again, in order to keep a city this size moving, uh, you had to be able to to communicate and uh, sway in some cases uh, decisions at the state and federal level uh, to do what's best for your community. And I had to be a real quick study and do a lot of traveling my first uh, couple of years. Uh, as mayor to go to Indianapolis and to go to D.C. and meet with all these people and try to create some type of working relationship. So that was pretty overwhelming initially. And I, at the time that I was running, I didn't really take that into consideration. I was thinking more at the local level and not what it was going to take at a, at a state and federal level. 
Is that probably, and maybe it's something different, but like the, the biggest unspoken challenge that folks don't even realize, you know, for running for mayor or, or taking the position, is there anything you could share? Would it be what you just said, or would there be anything different you'd add to that? Uh, well, I don't think there's any question that, that your ability to network uh, throughout uh, the community. And I had, I've been in Fort Wayne almost all my life. And again, I was on city council you know, for a number of years. So a lot of the local contacts I had already made, uh, either I knew them, again, professionally or personally. Uh, our family is quite large, so I was able to, to meet a lot of the business uh, men and women already. So locally, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly challenging, but uh, trying to make the contacts and set up a positive working relationship uh, at the state and federal level was uh, daunting in, uh, initially, uh, and, and I, but I think that's what I would suggest to anybody running for mayor, whether it's a, a smaller city or a larger one, is to be prepared to, uh, to work uh, day and night on creating positive working relationships because uh, you're going to need them as you try to move your community along. And how do you go about juggling the, the full-time job? Because obviously you, you've been a, a successful businessman, it looked like, at least from some of the research I did, and obviously being mayor and even on the council for many years. Is there anything you did from a time management or habit standpoint that kind of helps you stay organized <laughs> in all those different things? Well, you, 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 you said it uh, wisely when you said time management. Uh, Again, I, I, it doesn't really make uh, any difference in many cases the size of your community. Uh, every mayor that I've met, whether it's a smaller community or a large uh, city, uh, all of us uh, take our jobs very seriously. And many times you're talking about uh, day and night. Uh, it, and it, you really do need to, to plan your time very carefully. I I have a couple of um, uh, demands, if you will, for lack of a better word, uh, to my staff. You know, I don't I don't have any meetings before seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, from seven o'clock on, I'll meet. But I know a lot of people like to start their days at five a.m. and five thirty a.m. I, I I did that. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm getting too old to do that. Uh, so any meetings, I don't meet before 7 a.m. And they're uh, they're pretty good at scheduling meetings after that. Also, I require one weekend off a month to be with my family. So no cutting ribbons, no parades, uh, nothing like that. One weekend a month. Now, outside of that, I'll, I'll be glad to you know kick off 5K runs or, or whatever, uh, but my two requirements of my of my schedulers is no meetings before 7 a.m. and I want one weekend off a month to be with my family. But outside of that, uh, you know I I do get calls um, day and night. At, at night it's normally public safety calls if there's a uh, uh, unfortunately a a crime situation that the police chief wants me to be aware of or a, um, a several alarm fire that the fire chief thinks I need to be uh, notified of. And they do that because the media normally calls me when something like this breaks and would like to have an opinion. Well, the police and fire chief want to make sure that I get it from them directly before uh, it's released out to the general public or before media calls. Uh, but time management, as you said a few minutes ago, that's that's probably most uh, uh, the most important um, um, or one of the most important items that a mayor needs to consider. Otherwise, you'll burn yourself out. If you work day and night and don't take any weekends off and don't take any vacation, uh, you will burn out. Uh, I, I've seen it happen. Uh, I've, that's one of the reasons why I put some restrictions on my time because uh, you, you've got to have some downtime. So I'm pretty I'm pretty careful with that. What's been your your favorite part of the uh, the job of mayor? <laughs> well, it, uh, it, if you allow me, there's probably two things. One, 
is to be in a position where you can affect uh, the the life of your city uh, in, you know, in in a positive fashion. You know, there's been some decisions that I've been uh, able to make uh, that uh, you know have come to fruition that I'm very proud of, uh, and uh, to be able to be in a position to affect that kind of change to not only perhaps make life better for your current citizen base, but in some cases, uh, it'll be there for generations to come. And what a what a, uh, a, a wonderful position to be in, a wonderful position of trust that citizens give you in order to make those kind of decisions. So that uh, obviously is something that, that humbles me, but at the same time, uh, is uh, it, it's exciting to be in that kind of position. But the second thing that I really enjoy, and I know this may sound uh, somewhat Pollyannish, if you will, uh, but it's true. I love meeting with school children, uh, particularly elementary school. Uh, number one, uh, it's because they don't have an agenda other than uh, an innocent curiosity. You know, many times I meet with with uh, businessmen and women or with other groups, and I know going into that meeting that they have an agenda, whether it's it's stated beforehand or it's a hidden agenda that comes out during the meeting. Uh, I know that, they know that, uh, and it's a matter sometimes of just sitting down trying to figure out what the true agenda is, and it's it's tiring, but uh, it's necessary in this business. But when I meet with school children, and I'll take that up to middle school. High schoolers are a little bit different. Most high schoolers that I meet with, uh, I'm speaking to the government class, and it's a little more academic. But elementary school children uh, are absolutely wonderful to meet with. Uh, you know, they want to know things like uh, whether or not I have a bodyguard, or do I do I uh, have a limousine? Uh, do I live in a house like the White House? Uh, you know, have I ever uh, have I ever really met Santa Claus? Uh, you know, those kinds of questions. And again, I know they're very simplistic in nature, but it's very refreshing. Uh, it's it's almost a, a a respite period for me because they absolutely love the fact that someone uh, who they consider to be president of the city, not mayor, but president. Uh, is taking the time to to be with them. Sometimes I read books to them. Sometimes we sing. But Brian, it's it is a it's a a period of being mayor uh, that is so uh, refreshing because it's so innocent. So those two things are really um, make my job worthwhile. And, and you mentioned some of the decisions earlier you were proud of. Any any one or two that you'd share in more specific? Well, I think there's two things that have really had uh, an effect on our community that so far has has really helped contribute to uh, particularly our downtown being a catalyst for additional development uh, in our community. One is, believe it or not, is a bridge that we built. Uh, on a on a one-way avenue coming into downtown, we we named it the Martin Luther King Memorial Bridge, and it's an absolutely beautiful uh, bridge architecturally. But also we've set it up so we can light it at night different colors. We actually have, believe it or not, one million different variations of lights that we can do. Not only colors, but different schemes uh, and uh, and it's really neat to be able to, on a keyboard, to, to be able to play with the various uh, possibilities. And many times we'll light it up, uh, you know, for instance, on St. Patrick's Day, you know, we'll have it green for a couple of days. And and uh, the 4th of July, obviously, it's red, white, and blue for a few days. And Brian, if you, you know, got hold of me and, and there was an open day and you wanted it to be your college colors, and again, if no one had taken that particular day, there's no reason we can't do that for you. Uh, so we honor people's uh, anniversaries, uh, school colors, and I can go on and on. 
but it's a wonderful addition to our town as far as something that's very creative and innovative and uh, quite an attractive bridge as you come into our downtown. So that's one, and that's a decision that I made very early in my uh, uh, mayor uh, term, my first term, and uh, that turned out real nice. I was really proud of that. And again, it's still talked about, even though it's been up now for about nine or 10 years. Uh, the second, uh, I want to say, accomplishment that we were able to put together for downtown, we have a huge several block development where our baseball stadium is. Now, the baseball stadium was actually uh, in the process of being put together when I became mayor. So really, the credit for our minor league baseball stadium should go to my predecessor. Uh, and it is a um, we've won numbers of awards for the best minor league baseball stadium in the country. We've won that several times. Uh, it is a, a gorgeous uh, facility. But what we decided to do, though, was to continue the development all around the stadium. So attached to the stadium, we have a multi-floor parking garage to not only meet the needs of the stadium, but there were a number of businesses in the area uh, that were being um, stretched as far as uh, parking spaces for their respective employees. So this was going to take care of that, too. And then next to the parking garage, uh, we had received a number of requests from our convention center for more hotel space, so we built a hotel. We were able to negotiate that with the Marriott. So we built uh, an additional hotel, uh, which again, not only improved that area, but met the needs of our convention centers, so now they can get bigger conventions. But we also needed to have some additional reasons for people to visit the stadium other than a baseball game. So we built on the fourth side of the, uh, of the several block area a multi-use facility that now has hospitality and retail offerings on the first floor and then a couple of floors of offices and then the top two or three floors are, are apartments uh, overlooking the city and on one side and the <laughs> baseball stadium on the other so you can sit up there and watch a baseball game and it won't cost you. Ten dollars, but anyway, uh, so it's now a four-sided uh, uh, development, uh, but it has just uh, really served as a uh, again as a catalyst for uh, a significant amount of additional development downtown, from recreational to hospitality to, to housing. So those are the two that uh, really stand out as far as my first few years in office. And is there kind of on the other side of the coin there, you know, the challenges that the city faces, obviously as a, as a large city, there's a lot going on. Anything that you guys are anticipating maybe is a big challenge, something you're dealing with now or maybe over the next few years that you're trying to take measures to prepare for? Brian, I, I, I probably one uh Big concern we have now is the opioid challenge. Not unlike a lot of my colleagues and other communities, we're all facing different levels and different strains when it comes to uh, the drug situation in our respective communities. And we have seen a significant increase in opioid abuse and the ramifications of that in our community. Uh, and we're trying to get our head around it. We've uh, uh, we've had several seminars for public safety individuals. We've had educational offerings for social service networks. Uh, we're meeting with our educational facilities. So we're trying to take a look at, you know, what what not only uh, perhaps is is the, is uh, the cause of some of this, but also how how do we how do we again get our get our arms around uh, not only the enforcement but the education and treatment uh, as it relates to uh, the, the increasing uh, drug problem in our community. That's probably the biggest challenge that I have right now. We're trying to address it again from a multifaceted perspective. I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think it's you're going to have to involve your 
your again your your faith based community, your your social service network, uh, educational. Uh, we bring, we brought the state in for monies to help us develop additional treatment centers. Uh, again, I think we're we're uh, aggressively pursuing it, and I think that we're going to be able to uh, to address a lot of it. But unfortunately, I don't see uh, a quick end in sight. Uh, it took several decades for the realization that opioids were a problem. Uh, and I think it's going to be a while before we're able to to put ourselves in a position where we think we have complete control. Uh, that's my current biggest challenge. But I think looking at uh, the years to come, uh, I think probably access to capital is probably going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have. We're we're blessed right now in Fort Wayne to uh, to have a little bit of, of uh, of money, we have a pretty healthy cash balance, uh, and we have a we have a tax base uh, that supplies us sufficient revenue to support a lot of the programs and services that we have. But uh, as the economy uh, begins to turn, I think we're overall our local economy is is, is very good. We're at about three and a half percent unemployment. Uh, which we're interpreting as pretty much full employment. Uh, so we're in pretty good shape there. We we still need to work uh, to create some kind of synergy between our educators and our, and our employers to make sure that we're positioning ourselves with the right jobs for the future. Uh, but as our state and, and national economy turns and you, you know it will eventually, we've been on a tremendous positive ride for the last I don't know, Brian. What would you say? Ten years or so. Yeah, uh, it's it's been pretty good, uh, but everything is cyclical. And as a as a, a former businessman, as a mayor, we you know we get economic indicators. And uh, again, I think we're going to be okay for a while, but eventually it will turn. And when it does, uh, we're going to be very careful uh, uh, of our revenue streams to make sure that they can continue to support. So I think. Uh, uh, Access to capital is going to be a, a challenge in the future. Yeah, one of the things I want to mention too, because and, and I always like to hear perspective from you. You mentioned kind of you know some of your other peers that are kind of going through similar things with the opioid epidemic and stuff like that. And right. do you get right. a chance to? And I'm almost fail if I fail to ask about Mayor Pete uh, running for. for <laughs> Pete's maybe, a good friend. <laughs> maybe your take on that. I just thought about that, but uh, you could take that if you want. But uh, curious your thoughts just on working with your peers and and how you guys get involved. Maybe learning what they're doing or learning what not to do before you actually get involved with that. I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on some of that peer to peer um, relationship uh, you guys have in the state. Brian, it's imperative as far as I'm concerned uh, that mayors uh, meet. From time to time. In fact, I would take that down to our legislative bodies too, uh, that they should meet from time to time. I did not, or I was not provided the opportunity to do much of that when I was on city council, but obviously things have changed considerably since then. But I do meet with my fellow mayors. Uh, we have meetings every month uh, for those that can attend. We also have, I'm on the board of directors of our state uh, association, and I have a chance to meet with um, mayors from all over the state. Normally, we just meet from our different parts of the state. I happen to, or Fort Wayne happens to be in the northeast section of our state. So we mayors meet because some problems uh, or some challenges are, you know, specifically to our part of the state. But we do meet uh, with all of the mayors uh, from time to time every other month. And the reason I say it's imperative is because sometimes the, the challenges that might come up in your community uh, may have already been addressed by another community. And some of them have already developed best practices uh, uh, that could definitely apply to um, your community. So it, it really can ultimately save a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, a lot of money. If someone else has already gone through uh, a particular challenge, and they can share with you how they addressed it, and it might be applicable to your city. Uh, and then also, we brainstorm about 
uh, new opportunities that we have read about or heard about in other parts of the country that might be uh, something that uh, you know could serve our state well. Uh, so it's it's good for brainstorming. It's good for problem identification and solution identification, uh, education uh, in general. So there was a lot. Now, there's a lot of advantages of sitting with your peers and being able to spend some time with each other. And we also have some social time too. I don't want to. <laughs> I want to forget to say that. Did, I have to ask. Did, did you? I mean, with, with having Mayor Pete run, has that given uh-huh. you guys more um, notice on the state? Has that helped? I'm, I'm curious. Is, is it more media involved on that? I'm curious your thoughts, or if it hasn't affected you guys at all. Oh, yeah, there's no question that uh, uh, Mayor Pete has uh, has brought Indiana a little bit more to the to the forefront of national discussions. Uh, you know, it, Indiana uh, being in the Midwest and kind of tucked in between Ohio and Illinois uh, and below Michigan, many times uh, it's it's overlooked because we don't have uh, some of the uh, uh, larger cities like a Chicago or like a Detroit. Uh, so it's, it's not unusual for, believe it or not, for some people in this country, uh, not to know where Indiana is. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but, you know, as they say, it is what it is. Uh, but with Mayor Pete running, not only is he bringing, uh, some identification to the state of Indiana, but he's also putting South Bend, Indiana on the map. Now, Last time I saw Pete, I, I complained because Fort Wayne is, is over t- twice the size of South Bend, and he's getting all of the attention. Uh, then he just bluntly told me, well, if, maybe you should run for president. And uh, it's not in my cards. <laughs> but, uh, no, Pete is a, is a great guy. He's extremely intelligent, very articulate. Uh, I don't know whether he's going to be successful ultimately in his run. For president, but uh, I think he, he is definitely a breath of fresh air as far as some new and up and coming um, statesmen uh, wanting to represent uh, uh, the country. So I, I uh, uh, I'm very impressed with his with his uh, quest. So so let's end on this. I'm curious your thought, and and if you could take it on two roads. First is sure. I always like to kind of advice that you have. You've been doing this for a long time. Have a lot of mm-hmm. kind of wisdom. Um, from all these different roles you've been in uh, through the local government. One, any advice to your fellow mayors or other councilmen or throughout the country? Um, or on the other side of the coin, citizens, people that want to get involved, um, you know, any advice to them on getting involved or, or maybe why should, you know, stop making excuses to not get involved, maybe take it that way. Yeah. But I'm curious, any advice to end the uh, the interview on that, that you'd like to share? Well, I think every city, and quite frankly, every citizen really needs to uh, do a uh, do an assessment of what their city really needs to address as far as components to make their their city uh, a success. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, my cabinet and I we we said, we've identified six areas that we need to really stay on top of. Uh, one is public safety. So, you know, we make sure that we have an adequate police force. In our case, it's about 480 police officers uh, and uh, a well-functioning fire department. Make sure that we have the equipment and the training to make sure that, Brian, when you, if you live in Fort Wayne, when you go to bed at night, uh, that you've got a, a comfortable uh, feeling that you're being taken care of out on the street. So public safety is something we've identified as very important to us. Uh, obviously, economic development. As I mentioned, we're at about a 3.5% unemployment. But with that brings some additional challenges because, quite frankly, we have, in many cases, more jobs than we have qualified people. So we're in the process now of trying to create a partnership between our educators and our employers to make sure that the that the curriculums that the, our educators put together, that the degree offerings and the like, are in areas that are going to have jobs available for these graduates when they do complete 
uh, their degrees. Uh, so we bring those two together uh, to make sure that we have got the um, the foundation for continuation of you know good paying jobs in our community. Um, we like uh, another area is, is infrastructure. You know, just as much as our downtowns uh, are kind of the the the, the, uh, the heart of our cities, uh, the neighborhoods are certainly the the backbone, if you will. Uh, Employers may like our downtowns, but if we don't have neighborhoods with good housing stock and good streets and roads and curves and sidewalks and ADA ramps and the like, well, where are their employees supposed to move? Uh, I can't give the, the employer substantial financial incentives without making sure that if they move employees to our community, that we have nice, adequate neighborhoods. For them to live in, so our infrastructure is is something that we work on. Uh, as I mentioned, our downtown, we've invested heavily in our downtown because we think that that helps make our cities or our city a, a point of destination, so that you've got good uh, entertainment and hospitality offerings, and that your down my downtown is is uh, thriving and alive. Um, our park system. Uh, we take a look at that. We have a number of parks in our community, and our citizens love our parks. We have a zoo and we have a number of other offerings in the park system that our citizens want and, and deserve. So we spend you know, a lot of time uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our park system. And then finally, our city utilities. We happen to own our own city utilities. So the water and sewer programs are our responsibility. We wanna make sure that our citizens have good, clean water and a good, uh, a good sewer system. So, Brian, those are the six areas that we've identified as areas that our citizens are looking to us to provide for them uh, in, a, in a way that makes them proud to live here. And I would suggest that every city kind of do an inventory of the needs and wants of their citizens and put together a, a strategic plan to make sure that those, that those needs are met. Um, and then down the second road, though, something a little more altruistic, if you will, um, I ask my staff to do four things, and I stole these <laughs> from the West Point um, Army Academy. Uh, they have a maxim that serves um, that academy, and again, I stole it, and I kind of use it as the maxim for my staff. And if you'll allow me, uh, it simply says to to care more than others think is wise, to risk more than others think is safe, to expect more than others think is possible, and to dream more than others think is practical. That's what I ask my staff to do, and. Uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's served us well. Now that's really great. Um, and, and yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good way to end on some good advice there to, uh, to kind of share out for, uh, for everyone listening. So, uh, Mayor Henry, this has been really fun. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and a lot of things going on in Fort Wayne there and, uh, and good luck to you. Hope to uh, keep in touch. Brian, thanks so much. Feel free to call me anytime. Hey everyone, just one more quick thing before you run along on your day. Um, please head over to iTunes, leave us a quick review, give us a rating, let us know how we're doing so we can make this podcast better each and every episode um, and really put out a good product here um, for you guys to listen in and learn a little bit more about your local communities and some of the folks that are running them. Um, we certainly appreciate you sticking in, um, listening through these and providing that feedback and hope you guys will join on the next episode. Take care and have a phenomenal day.